Oh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this important conference. I've been given the job of introducing you to the concept of global health diplomacy, and what I mean by that is to try and describe the interface between global health and foreign policy. I want to try and achieve three things in the next 15 minutes before my red light goes on, and that is, they are, uh, first of all, to provide a bit of background to why this concept has emerged um, and why we refer to it as a new diplomacy. Second, I want to describe the different ways that the term has been used, the kind of hype side of, uh, of my talk. And then thirdly, to try and bring us back to understand more concisely what, uh, what it actually means. Well, let's begin with some brief uh, background. Well, I liken the global policy environment to something like the Tower of Babel. And if you know this, this story from the Bible, um, people were, there, were afflicted with the inability to speak to each other because of all different languages. And, and eventually the story goes that this led to confusion, um, to, division, uh, to division, and eventually to, to, um, to disaster ultimately. Uh, for those of you who work as policymakers, and I don't know who here uh, is from that background, but you'll, you'll find this uh, a very familiar scenario. I think Sarah um, um, and in the previous uh, panel discussion referred to it as people working within silos. And this is a very common, very difficult uh, situation that we find ourselves due to different institutional mandates, uh, different policy spheres, different professional networks, different disciplinary backgrounds. We find ourselves very much divided uh, in the policy world. Policy, therefore, is often not unified. Uh, and this is particularly the case um, in, in global health. Uh, so you say RCT and they always say GDP and you end up with uh, let's call the whole thing off. It's very much a, a, a difficult uh, way of speaking at cross purposes. Now this state of affairs has never been satisfactory, but in global health, and as global health has grown, uh, these divisions have become much more apparent. The health policy community <coughs> has known for a long time that um, the determinants of health are f lie far beyond the health sector. Many of us know this who work in public health. Issues such as um, you know, environment, uh, trade, finance, uh, and so on, are increasingly recognized as important to tackle if we're dealing with uh, the broad determinants of health. More recently, foreign policymakers have also come to realize that they have to get beyond what they see as their traditional boundaries, their silos. So they have to get beyond the security, trade and finance issues and look to uh, some of the health issues that have been coming onto their radars what they see traditionally as domestic or low politics issues, uh, very much they need to, to recognize that they are, that they've become high politics issues. Now this mutual recognition has led to uh, a building of closer integration or at least an attempt to bridge those, those silos, to bring those areas together and, and, and um, to bring, as I say, global health and foreign policy closer together. For those of us um, working in the global health field, um, this has meant a need to understand and engage with what can be a very rarefied world of diplomacy, which Sarah just described very nicely. Now, traditionally, diplomacy is about the art or practice of conducting international relations, such as negotiating treaties and agreements. Um, often it's done by lawyers, but also by very well-trained uh, diplomats who go to particular training um, and, and, and so on. There's a particular career pattern that diplomats take. Interstate diplomacy, which is diplomacy between uh, sovereign countries, uh, goes back uh, in history to the early Renaissance uh, when the state system began to emerge uh, in Italy and then eventually uh, when the international state system was established uh, in the 1600s. And that's when we can trace back the tradition of embassies, ambassadors, uh, high commissions, and so on. And the whole um, etiquette of the way diplomats interact and the sort of language that they use. And it, it, it's very much a, a culture that, that diplomats move within. 
uh, the classic, I suppose, uh, treatise on this is written by Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince, which was kind of a handbook at the, di at the time uh, for diplomats to follow in terms of trying to, to uh, uh, gain political influence and power. Now today, negotiations uh, by diplomats are very different from um, uh, the Renaissance, of course. But formally, we still see uh, the world being dominated by, f by these diplomats. And so diplomats, you can understand, uh, their particular role is really to uh, further to pursue a country's foreign policy. And here I define foreign policy as the activity whereby these state actors, uh, governments, they can act, react, and interact at this boundary between what is domestic and what is foreign, or what is internal and what is external to a country. So that's their role. They're, they're at that interface. Um, and in, in that uh, role, the key word is negotiation. So they are always negotiating in various ways, either formally or informally, with their counterparts. And as I say, it's a, it can be a very rarefied role, although I've had diplomats tell me it isn't. It's not as glamorous as people think. Uh, a lot of, uh, of hard work, um, but also very sort of um, uh, detailed, uh, very slow process of, of, gaining, uh, of gaining positions and so on. Today what we talk about increasingly is something that, that's referred to as new diplomacy. Now new diplomacy is very different from what I've just described, this kind of old diplomacy. But how is it new? Uh, people have been struggling with how is old diplomacy different from new diplomacy. Well there's a various ways. First of all, um, there's very much um, uh, the, a different context. So we've talked a lot in this conference about different players, uh, different um, countries that are coming to the fore. So traditionally we've had before uh, the 1990s a cold, the Cold War superpower uh, rivalry. Now we have the BRIC countries. And there's, there's much more happening than just the BRIC countries, but they're kind of symbolic of what, what is changing. So there's a geopolitical reconfiguration of the international state system. Secondly, there's globalization. And I won't go into what globalization is. We all kind of have a gut sense of, of, of what's happening. But really, the greater interconnectedness of the world. And that's requiring us, really, to, to, um, to conduct diplomacy in a different way than just state versus state or state to state. What we have in this sort of combination of developments is that we see new collective action problems emerging which need negotiation, which need addressing through different mechanisms, different players, uh, different regulatory governance uh, systems. And so this new way of, this new, these new challenges require a new way of, of, of achieving them. And so what we have is what, I guess, David Miliband, who's our, our former UK foreign, foreign uh, minister, in his inaugural speech in 2007, he captures it very well uh, when he describes the need for this new diplomacy. He talks about the environment for diplomacy has been affected by a series of shifts in the distribution of power at international level, this kind of geopolitical shift. Balance of power is no longer a basis for diplomacy. Today, the new diplomacy needs to reflect the new distribution of power. And the new distribution of power changes the way we need to analyze threats and exploit opportunities. So what are these, what are these new features of, of new diplomacy? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a bigger policy agenda than ever before. As I talked about these global collective action problems, um, really there's a broader range of issues than the diplomats had to deal with. You know, traditionally diplomats had to deal with wars, they had to deal with trade, and you know, this kind of um, uh, conflict and money type, type issues, which is really the bread and butter of, of diplomats. It certainly wasn't all of it, but certainly that was the core interest. And today we have things like resource diplomacy, environment diplomacy, um, people talk about disaster diplomacy, internet diplomacy, and within that kind of new agenda, we have health diplomacy. The, the next thing there is that we have a greater diversity of diplomatic actors in the broad sense. There's still formal diplomats, but there are a lot more people engaging in what may be loosely described as diplomatic activities. 
Um, there may be um, uh, state uh, actors alongside private sector actors who may influence the diplomatic process. There are also civil society organizations, many of which are represented at this conference, who deal with a lot of these uh, negotiating uh, processes.